I think that employers are going to see a lot more turnover than expected. Right now, turnover is at an all-time high. Just get your work done. You're just another number. You're lucky to be here. What's your two cents on kind of that dichotomy? I think it's really important that employers take that empathetic and compassionate approach. They're going to see such a difference in how their employees act, the morale, the culture, the performance. Statistically, is only 5% of employees actually access an EAP program. So we've got a lot of businesses out here that talk about supporting large organizations with EAPs, but people still don't access those resources. Employees are always, unless they're truly happy in their workplace, they're always gonna chase the next best thing, more money, whatever it may be. everybody welcome back to a brand new episode of the heart and hustle podcast especially for a brand new episode in our hr heroes series you know on this podcast we talk about the heart and the hustle that are necessary for success in business and in life and i'm incredibly excited to bring my guest on today jamie palace she's the founder and ceo of j palace llc and a principal and vice president of human resources and recruiting at rkp advisory as well jamie Thank you so much for being with me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. So Jamie, you know, there is amazing science that's out there about the practice of gratitude and the impacts on our own personal life to express gratitude to somebody else and have them say something that they are grateful for not only impacts the people who are sharing, but everybody else around them. And I just want to start off the episode by saying how grateful I really am for having you here today. And if you want to take a couple seconds, what are you grateful in your world today? I'm grateful for being here as well. Um, Thank you for finding me on LinkedIn and asking me to join your podcast. Um, I'm super excited about it. It's going to be awesome. Well, you know, I want to give a couple seconds to introduce you to the audience. You know, like you said, you and I connected on LinkedIn, and I've been on a mission to share the insights, the tactics, and the approach to HR Because in our world of business today, and in life in general, it seems like we're losing so much of the human element. And when you and I spoke first, we talked about one of your human experiences in college. And you made the incredibly scary jump from being and studying for a nursing degree, and then realizing that it just wasn't the right fit for you. But you still wanted to help people in some other capacity. And Mm -hmm. something that you said was you were taking a course on industrial and organizational psychology, and you had a professor say, hey, Jamie, I think you might want to pursue HR. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that early nursing experience for yourself? And then let's dive a little bit deeper into your background as well. Yeah, so I originally um, applied for nursing school, got in, completed about three and a half years. And just before my last semester, I was like, "Mm, this isn't for me, but I love the aspect of helping people. Didn't really know what I was going to do. Um or where I wanted to take my career from there. Sat down with my parents. I sat down with counselors at school trying to figure it out. Switched my major to um, psychology and biology. And I was, you know, obviously just going through the motions at that point, figuring out what to do next. Took an IO psychology class and was suggested that this may be a good route for me. From there, I started doing some research on human resources and how, you know, there are similarities with IO psychology and HR and what my next steps could be. I then got a internship in HR at a construction management firm in New York City and fell in love with it. And then worked my way up the ladder from there. I mean, that <laughs> what I wanted to really talk about today was that scary experience, right? And yeah. I feel like so many people today in, especially in the younger demographic, right? We're both in our thirties. We go mm-hmm. through school and we're told that like, this is the path that you're going to go down. So make a choice, stick with it. And then so many people get into their field or start experiencing the nuances of the, even their nursing degree, right? Yeah. And they're like, this just isn't for me. So that type of conversation you were having with your parents about like, I just don't think this is for me. 
Let's walk through that a little bit and how scary that was and some of the steps that you took to kind of refortify your mindset to be able to say, I'm going to choose a different path. What was that like? Oh, I was terrified. Especially so young, like there's so much pressure on everyone to figure out what you want to do at 17 years old when you're applying for colleges. Like you're so young. Do you really know what you want to do at that point? Um, So obviously like three, four years later, as you're going through the motions of taking the courses and seeing if this is really for you, it was like, there's that feeling of like, I'm just not happy. So obviously my parents were very supportive and they wanted to see me happy and, you know, we're going to support any decision that I made and what I wanted to do with my future. And I'm very appreciative and grateful for that. Um, Speaking with the school, a little different, you know, they're always pushing you to finish your track. Are you sure you want to change? It's going to add an extra semester or whatever it may be to graduate. But in the end, it was the best decision I've made. So that feeling, even that with that feeling, fear, uh, put it aside. Yeah, I know. I mean, that, like, that <laughs> fortifying our mindset, right, is just like such a process that we have to be happy. I think oh, yeah. the emphasis on that is just so important. I've seen so many people in the older generations pick a path of life, and then they look back 25, 30 years later, and they're like, oh, my gosh, I never yeah. was truly in alignment with who I wanted to be in this world. And like that is a sense of regret that I would never want to have. And so I'm just so proud of you for making that scary change. But I know you. there's so many other people out there who want to make that change too, but they just don't know where to get started. You know what I mean? It's so crazy because, I mean, we're young, we're in our thirties, but even at the time when I was changing majors, no one really did that. You kind of just stuck your course. But ever since I made that change, I guess over the past like couple of years, I've realized that so many people now are okay with making that change. And honestly, that makes me very happy. Um, And I know I told you last time, hopefully at some point I could take my business at J Palace LLC and expand it to working with college students or even high school students and helping them figure out like, what, what is your path? What do you want to do? Or how are you going to prepare for your future? Um, If you're not happy, okay, then let's figure out your next steps or how could we prepare you for that interview that you have coming up or whatever it may be? Um, I want to be a resource for people of all ages and all steps of their career. And I'm so glad that you brought that up because human resources, right? I think like we talked about when we first connected that so many businesses have lost the human element of business, but also the human element of life. And especially when we think about our professional careers, like everybody says, you have to pick something, you have to stick with it, don't give up on it. And that entire experience is so stressful, especially for younger people. And so Mm. I was hoping that you were going to bring that up because that was going to be my next point about, (laughs) you know, supporting the generation that's coming up behind us. Because those are truly the people who really need the support to make those scary types of decisions. So let's talk a little bit about um, J Palace LLC and the other work that you're doing as well. Give us an overview of your company and what your mission is from an HR perspective to help organizations make these changes toward the future of leadership. Yep. So J Palace LLC is a full service HR consulting and recruiting company. Um, And my goal is to help empower organizations to kind of uplift their employees because in the end, employees... And people are your biggest asset. Without them, you don't really have your company. Um, So my goal is to work with with organizations and change their mindset to take an employee approach first, um, a people approach first, I should say. Um, It's so important that organizations put more of a focus on their employees even if it's just a a weekly check-in or whatever it may be, because in the end, we're still human. So yes, it's good to have that day-to-day hustle, but we get so lost in it. And we're still human. Humans still need validation. They still need recognition. They still need whatever it may be. So I want to help organizations, you know, 
pull that out and, and, and help them, you know, recognize and, and give their employees the engagement that they need. So what are some of the biggest challenges that you see from your position in HR right now, when you go into your consulting gigs and you yeah. engage with different like leadership groups, what are some of the biggest challenges that these organizations face and not having that people first mentality? What are some of the things that you see? I would say leadership buy-in. So let's say um, leaders don't necessarily prioritize not that they're not prioritizing putting people first. It's just that they're getting so caught up that they may forget to, you know, so I want to help implement different ways. So it's just streamlined. You don't, it, you don't have to think about it. It just happens naturally, you know? So what are some of the, I would say, best practices? Because you and I both come from, I would say, a technologically native world yes. right we were born in the 1990s we grew up with te a little bit before technology right but now we've yeah. seen it explode in our lifetime yeah. so what are some best practices and innovative approaches that you've seen and or you've implemented with different organizations when it comes to i would say overcoming some of those human first challenges like what are some of the suggestions and innovative approaches that you use so my biggest suggestion to employers or leaders, managers, how, however you want to phrase it, is don't wait until the annual review, that one-time review. Have weekly check-ins, do quarterly reviews, whatever it may be, but speak with your employees, give them current feedback, give them positive feedback, whatever, constructive feedback, whatever it is, but it has to be current. If you wait until the end of the year and it's December or January, you're rolling out your performance reviews, the connection's lost. Where is that connection? Again, going back, we're still human. We still need that connection. We still need validation, whether it's good or bad. So do it more often. To, even if it's a five-minute weekly check-in, that's all you need. Let your employees feel valued. And I've seen um, organizations implement that and they'll come back and be like, wow, I've seen such a huge difference in our workplace culture. And from there, when you see a difference in your workplace culture, performance is automatically going to improve. So that that's my that's where I typically start. And I've seen I've seen it do wonders. Um, if you're looking at more of like a well-being kind of side of it, I like to implement um, wellness programs. So. Let's, let's implement awareness and educational seminars, or um, let's send out, did you know emails about certain mental health topics, whatever it may be, how can the organization support that employee or their families, how, whatever it may be, whatever struggles they're going through. Um, and I, and I, again, seen it do wonders. This is a topic that is near and dear to my heart, right? The work yeah. that we do here at Francis really is about spreading positivity and encouragement yes. in life, but also in the workplace. And when yes. it comes to wellness, I think so many organizations think about wellness being like a policy and a procedure, right? We're going to bring in a fractional therapist, or we're going to give you guys access to an app or something like that. But those things, unfortunately, don't get utilized, right? right. They're very much like this is a resource that's available to you guys, but that stuff never really does the job. Yeah. And so we always think about how do we spread opportunities of wellness within an organization and being able to just read a simple text message from our perspective yeah. is a conversation starter that gets people on that road, right? Because it, like you said a little earlier, wellness is something that we shouldn't have to always think about. And I like the way that you phrase that it should happen in the background. And so that's yeah. why I'm so, you know, encouraged to work with different types of teams when it comes to this kind of stuff as well. And here's an interesting statistic. Um, mm -hmm. The National Safety Council came out with a study in 2022 that said organizations today pay $15,000 per employee that has mm -hmm. poor mental health in absenteeism, lost productivity, and turnover. Yep. And so if you're thinking about how do you support your organization from a business first perspective, it means supporting the people inside the organization so they can show up as their best self every single day, which is really interesting to me. So when it comes to, I would say, like the wellness and well-being perspective from your HR landscape, 
what are some of the things that you think about mental wellness in the workplace, especially in this negative and more stressful world more than ever? Are those things important to you? Or what is what's your perspective on that? On mental health and mental well being in the workplace? Oh, absolutely. We should always put that first. Yeah. Um, I mean, Again, going back to like the resources that we were talking about before, employers would be like, oh, well, we have an EAP program, which is an employee assistance program. They could use that. They'll get some free sessions and then they can use, you know, free therapy sessions and then they could use it through their insurance. Okay, that that's a great resource and I'm glad you have that. But let's implement some other stuff, even if it's just a educational piece or um, a weekly team meeting on Fridays where you all have lunch together and just separate yourselves from work for a bit. But it is so important to put mental health and well-being first in the workplace, because again, it's, it's going to improve your performance. So I think it's really important that employers take that empathetic and compassionate approach and they're, they're going to see such a difference in how their employees act, the morale, the culture, their performance, and I, I don't think that they would ever have any regrets doing that. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I know statistically is only 5% of employees actually access an EAP program. So we've got a lot yeah. of businesses out here that talk about supporting large organizations with EAPs, but people still don't access those resources. And yeah. so you have to find those gap fillers, right, that nurture the relationship with the culture that you're trying to establish in your organization. That stuff is just so incredibly important. And I want to get your two cents on this as well. Mm -hmm. So when we think about the younger generation, right, like us, yeah. but more importantly, the mid young 20s who are coming yes. into this space, they want to be seen and validated. So what do you think is going to happen in the future if they these new style employees, if you will, come across old school leadership of just get your work done, you're just another number, you're lucky to be here. What's your two cents on kind of that dichotomy and that friction that's going to be caused? I think that employers are going to see a lot more turnover than expected. Right now, turnover is at an all-time high. Um, employees are always, unless they're truly happy in their workplace, they're always going to chase the next best thing, more money, whatever it may be. And that's because they're not truly happy in their workplace. If they're valued and they're recognized, then they won't necessarily need to chase the dollar. Um, but I do think that if if the culture doesn't change in a workplace, then retention rates are, are going to plummet, turnover is going to be through the roof, and, employ and organizations and employers are going to suffer. And there's nothing scarier from a leadership perspective of <laughs> thinking you're going to hire a team, right? And then they just turn over because they're not happy in their place. And I think yeah. that's a different, I would say, version of the modern work experience is people just aren't going to stick around for an organization who doesn't yeah. prioritize them, especially from Absolutely. the people and the human element. And I know that the younger generation for sure is going to be like, dude, I can go on TikTok. I can hop on Instagram and YouTube. I don't yeah. need to be here if I'm not happy. And like you said, it's not about always chasing the dollar but it's about that fulfillment, right? We want to live life and be happy as possible. Yeah. Yeah, it's... So one of the questions I have for you... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, it's okay, you can go. I was going to say, so my next question for you is, yeah. what are your personal experiences when it comes to mental wellness? Have you ever gone through your own struggles in the environment of work and life? And what has kind of the prioritization of your own wellness kind of represented to you? I absolutely have struggled with mental wellness and mental health issues in the workplace. And it's intimidating, I have to say. From personal experience, it's very intimidating going into work every day and truly struggling. But if you have the leadership that's going to support you, it makes a world of a difference. At the time, I had my supervisor she she was great she supported me and provided resources and just even just listened not necessarily that we were talking about my mental health issues but when it came to work and what i needed out of work she listened helped me got me to the next step 
And I couldn't be more grateful for that because so many of the times, again, going back to what I said earlier, everyone gets so stuck in that hustle, the day-to-day hustle, and they have blinders on. They're not necessarily paying attention to their coworkers or their employees, whoever it may be. And it can be very isolating. But to have someone that's going to support you, listen to you, and help you get to that next step, it's it's the best feeling ever. So I, I encourage all supervisors, management teams, HR, whoever it may be, to support and listen to your employees because it can make the world of the difference. It's fundamental for business success. You know, one of the things that we talked about, and I'm going to yank out my book really quick, which I shared yeah. with you previously is the book 12 and a half, right? By Gary Vee, who talks about leveraging the necessary in- or emotional ingredients for, ne- uh, for business success. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know what? I love his approach to this because when we talk about things like a positive work environment, when we talk about a culture of encouragement and support, that's one thing for the team to do it. But the leaders of the organization really set the tempo and everything water falls down from there. And so I love the fact that you're talking about managers and leaders and the C-suite and HR, all being those leaders who can waterfall and trickle down positivity because it's very difficult to be a negative person when you're surrounded by leaders who care, invest, and really think about your well-being as a priority. And I love the fact that you kind of took it there, but you know, Gary Vaynerchuk, so anybody who's watching or listening today, go check out this book, 12 and a half, leveraging the emotional ingredients necessary for business success. It's a great one because it talks about all of the 12 and a half different ingredients. So I'm going to take a little bit of a sidebar here because the 12 and a half ingredients in here, Jamie, are some really interesting ones, but there's a lot in here that a lot of people don't think about. So I have Mm. a question for you. When it comes to empathy, why do you think empathy is something that's important for leaders to demonstrate when it comes to supporting their teams? They have to be able to not necessarily put themselves in their shoes, but they need to be able to see different perspectives so that they could better help and guide that their employees. And I think it's very important to be empathetic and compassionate in the workplace. I mean, there's like empathy in itself, like you said, with an honest and open heart and being able to engage in thoughtful conversations and putting ourselves in the shoes to ask, how can I support you and understand the human element of like, you know, a lot of employees show up to work and they carry all of the personal life experiences with them. Maybe they've had a bad day. Maybe they received bad news on that day. And sometimes we don't show up as our best self. So being empathetic from my perspective is a gigantic I would say superpower of the best leaders to be able to put themselves in their employee shoes. Um, my next topic of conversation here is I took some polls and asked okay. some questions of my audience and said, what type of things do you see in HR? What topics, what problems, what challenges do we face? And the top one that came in was HR is too policy driven. And one thing I know about HR in general is we create all these policies and procedures, right? And they're the code that the organization is supposed to live by. And a perfect one is the employee handbook. And I recently saw you post on LinkedIn about how an employee handbook needs to be reviewed on an annual basis. And I love this because organizations are changing so quickly in today's world of business. But let's talk about from your perspective, why the I would say review of an employee handbook is so important, especially on an annual basis. So our, okay. So this is an is open into questions. So there's so much to go in here. So yeah. yes, c- companies are becoming very policy driven and it could be both beneficial and negative in the workplace. Um, I think to employees, it's it's viewed as very negative. Um, but there are aspects that, of course, are going to be used to protect a company, but also protect the employees. Um, I don't think many people actually read the employee handbook and see how beneficial and protective it could be for an employee. Um, so I do encourage that you actually read your employee handbook at some point. But policies, laws, regulations, they're always changing. 
And it doesn't necessarily have to be based off of uh, the EEOC made a change to this law and we have to update our handbook, but it could be as simple as we're changing our performance management process from annual reviews to quarterly reviews and biweekly check-ins and this is the process and this is how it should be and you're updating your handbook. Things are always changing and your handbook is essentially a resource for the employer and employee to go and view how things should be done in that organization, essentially like a contract, if you want to say. But um, yes, I understand why employees think of policy-driven workplaces as a negative thing, but in the end, it, 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 it's beneficial to them as well. Um, so yeah, I, I think that honestly should probably be updated more than once a year, but a lot of employers forget to, the employee handbooks even there. So a minimum once a year, but maybe even more in my opinion. Yeah. I was thinking about how quickly technology in itself is moving. Right. And it affects yeah. everything that we do. Like p the pandemic was a great example, right? People yeah. went into these remote workforces, they started working hybrid, they're doing all these different types of things. But yeah. I doubt many organizations actually thought about the process of updating their employee handbook to reflect the new landscape of work. No. Because I think uh, if I was in your two cents or in your shoes, going into an organization, do you ever see organizations that have an employee handbook that was written when the company was founded, but it's never been updated? Oh, yeah. I was uh, working with an organization a few months back and they're like, I was doing an HR gap analysis for them and they were like, oh, um, yeah, we have an employee handbook. I was like, oh, okay, great. When was it written? Um, it was updated last maybe seven years ago. I was like, okay, well, a lot has changed since. So that that's probably step number one, but let's see what else, uh, where, there, where there are gaps. So yeah, no, it's at employee, employers always forget about the employee handbook. Yeah, I mean, I know that we published one back in, and this is pointing like fingers directly at me, but we published <laughs> our employee handbook most recently in the mid 2021. And so as I'm listening to you talk about yep. the importance of review, I'm like, wow, me and the team need to go back and look at the employee handbook to be able to make sure we're in alignment with where the world is at today, especially. Yeah. Um, so much has, has been, changed since know, 2021. So I know so much, seriously. <laughs> I mean, even the way that much <laughs> engages with... Um, like AI, right? I mean, yeah. AI and technology are being emphasized more so than ever. They create so many efficiencies. And yeah. I think being tactical about an expectation about how my team should also utilize technology would be very beneficial um, in the employee handbook and establishing those expectations as well. Um, yeah, exactly. Because I think today in the world, we're always looking to be more proficient. Work today takes less time than ever. Yeah. And being able to be as proficient as possible and efficient as possible is uh, something that's super important that more people need to pay attention to. Is your so team mostly remote? Today, yeah, we're a hundred percent remote. Okay. So everybody is working from their own devices, their own stations. And I think, you know, more and more businesses, especially today are in a remote setting, right? Mm -hmm. And thinking about how we enable our team with the appropriate tools is something we can talk about. But if that's in a policy and procedure, right, in the employee handbook and the expectation is set, that's a more effective way of going about that kind of stuff. Exactly. Um, so this, this has been very beneficial for me. <laughs> so I appreciate you know, your consultative experiences. Um, well, a couple of things that we talked about today, Jamie, yeah. as we kind of enter our last leg here was we talked about, you know, the big changes that people make early in their career, the importance of happiness and aligning truly with that. The fact that organizations are changing quicker than ever, but more importantly, from your perspective, the human element of business and why it needs to be retained and refortified. So my question for you is, if you had a piece of advice to other HR leaders who are in a situation where the organization just isn't where they know it should be, what pieces of advice would you give to them to approach leadership and talk about the changes that are necessary for them to kind of tackle 2024 with a full head of steam from a culture perspective? From a culture perspective specifically? I would say from a, when or I say culture, I mean from like a human centric perspective. Okay. Um, 
So I would always suggest hearing from your employees first. Let's implement some employee engagement surveys. Where do the employees think changes need to be made? What what do they like about the company? What do they not like about the company? Where do they see the culture? Um, you can learn a lot from your from your employees. And a lot of the times leaders don't necessarily like to take, I don't want to call it advice, but they don't like to hear what the employees have to say. But <clears throat> if you take the time to listen and see where their where the employees struggles are what they love about the company you you could really you could go far with that because they're going to be brutally honest so that they could be happy and they could feel valued and they could be recognized in the workplace um so i i, I always say start there see what see what the employees say and you can learn a lot I mean, even in business, right? We think about how we can deliver the best service possible and the best yeah. form of feedback is your customer. And if you think yeah. about the role of a leader and a CEO, leaders in HR, your internal customer is your team. And so yeah. emphasizing feedback from them and being able to create a feedback flywheel so we can improve quickly, um, I think is something that is incredibly ad advantageous. And I really suggest that everybody does those things because yeah. It's often the people who are right in front of you who have the best sense of what's going on and how we can improve as well. But that shouldn't be an intimidating process for no. leaders today is getting feedback from their team. And I think we're seeing a big change in that, especially with leaders like you. Yeah, I think a great thing to implement as well. Um, it's a heavy lift, but I think a great thing are 360 reviews. Let's hear from everyone. It doesn't have to just be what your supervisor thinks of how you are doing. Let's hear from your colleagues. Let's hear from your supervisors. Let's hear from customers or clients that you're working with. It's It should be a well-rounded review, not just a, a one-person um, approach. So three, three six year reviews totally are, are great as well. Yeah, I mean, the more feedback we get, the better we can be, right? Exactly. I think it's as simple as that. Yeah, and that's well, all Jamie, employees want. want create... Exactly, is that feedback, <laughs> right? And that feedback. That validation process. Well, yeah. Jamie, this has been an absolutely amazing time. You giving insights and, you know, your approach to HR. I think you've given some amazing insta uh, examples of what the future is going to look like for you as you start impacting the younger generation to get over some of those scary experiences as well. Yes. I want you to take a couple last seconds here um, to share a little bit more about where people can find you and more information about your business. So if they find themselves in a place where HR just isn't having the impact that they're looking for. How can they reach out to you and find more about your services? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can go to my website at jpalacellc.com. So J-P-A-L-A-C-E-L-L-C.com. Or you can find me on LinkedIn at Jamie, J-A-M-I, Palace. Um, and I'm, I'm open ears. So please reach out at any time and I'd, I'd love to help. Well, guys, there you go. You heard where you can find Jamie and her approach to supporting the people of your organization. Thank you so much, Jamie, for being willing to make scary changes in your life because I know you're going to have a huge impact on the future generations of workers. Yeah. And I know how much you've overcome to get to where you are today in an entrepreneurial journey, in a life journey perspective. And once again, I just want to share a little bit of gratitude with you because I know that some of the challenges you face from a mental health perspective have been challenging at times, as we all have. But one thing I love to emphasize to the audience is we are all stronger together, right? You've got friends around you. You've got people who are willing to listen. And if you're going to lean on others, they're going to lean on you as well. So, Jamie, thank you so much for being a part of this episode. I really appreciate you. Thank you. I'm so appreciative. Thank you for having me. All right, guys, that's been another episode of the Heart and Hustle podcast, a brand new episode specifically of our HR Heroes series. So Jamie, round of applause for you for being an HR hero. I appreciate <laughs> you and everything that you're doing for the next generation. Everybody have an amazing day. Thank you so much. We'll catch you in the next one.